Hi, this is Cameron Bowen, voice of Toy Man, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Chandelier, D, 5, 3. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Shanley Samboy. Shanley is a law student at APEC University in the Dominican Republic, where she's also been participating in Model UN since her first year of high school. Shanley has also attended Model UN conferences, such as the International Conference of the Americas and the New York Model United Nations Conference for Latin America in the Caribbean. And aside from all of those awesome accomplishments, she also happens to like Young Justice. <laughs> Shanley, welcome to Whelmed. Thank you. It's an honor for me to be here. I always admire your, uh, all of your passion, passion that you put in the program as well. And I will listen to you every week. Aw, thank you so much. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone listening at home that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including episodes 1 through 18 of season 3, what we've watched so far, the comics, and the video game. So if you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, but uh, could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do? Well, I think something that defines me as a person is my family. I grew up with a, a family with all boys, and I was, you can see the family photo, you can see all boys and a little girl in the corner. And I can remember well every Sunday we, we we used to live close. Now everyone live in a in a, a different part in the city, but we used to watch Justice League Unlimited, Star Wars: The Clone Wars, Ben Ten, Scooby Doo, Mister Incorporated as well, and all of those shows that I like. And made me the, thanks to my cousins that I consider my brothers. Thanks to them, I, they introduced me to this world of pop culture. Even if the school is uh, back in the day, it was kind of different to hear a girl say, "Hey, I liked superheroes when I was when I was later." And the, in my my th- my classmate said, "Oh, that's kind of weird." But I thanks God, I, now twelve years later, it's really common to see a girl, "Hey, I like Spider Man." Hey, I like I like Batman. I love Marvel movies. I love DC. When a girl said, "I like superheroes," or oh, post school to like a Star Wars, I say. Thank you. <laughs> I just say thank you for thank you for that. And something that I really define me is my mother introduced me to the world of movies. We discussed movies, the plot, and I remember myself when I was little, always watching those TV shows that explain the behind of scenes yeah, of the yeah. movies. They explain all the um, it's my favorite part was the when the actors were talking about their characters, the complexity of all the characters, and I was say. Oh, please tell me more. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that that's that's kind of interesting. I always enjoy the pop culture. And one day in my first year in high school, I in that time I was a little girl, kind of shy person who don't say what they think out loud and always talk when I get in com- in confident with someone. And my math teacher, she said, You are amazing. And you will do great things in your life if you just speak out what you think. And maybe you should join um, Moon, the model of UN. And I was like, eh, um, no, 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 no. I don't want that. Thank you. I don't want to give a speech with a lot of people there. No. She tried to convince me a lot. And she decided, okay, I can convince this girl. So she chose another target, my mother. <laughs> yep. She did that. And she convinced my mother that was a great opportunity to develop capacity to speak out loud correctly, le- a leadership cap- a leadership capacities. So this is how I get to this war of diplomacy. And I think it's one of the best decisions that I did in my life because when you interpret it a diplomatic, a, a lot of people say that the, mo- the model of UN open your eyes at what's happening around the world, all the problems and how those problems affect us 
directly or indirectly. And that's that's something amazing. This is how basically all the star. <laughs> so that so that's how you got into Model UN in high school? Uh teacher recommended it for you? Uh recommended, combines my model. <laughs> yes, pretty much. <laughs> One or the other, same thing. Uh and you've been doing that since since like freshman year of high school? Yes, and now in the um, that was in Kafam because my university have a school, so I was part of the school, and then I go to the university, and, and that university. So I part of Semoni, that is the, the United Nations club that the university have. In the model, we the the participants, we basically are like you, Emily. We are actors. We have to learn about our our country, our the politics. So, uh, if we want to be part of the of the competition, we have to be diplomatists and we have to study what my country will say or will act according to the situation. That's the authority our evaluation, not just your creative idea to solve a problem that is happening right now that the UN is dealing. It's your interpretation in that in that way. That's super cool. Uh, <laughs> and we will be definitely be talking about a lot more of that later because of what our topic is today. But before we get into all of that, I do want to ask, when did you first see Young Justice? Did you watch it on DVD, on Netflix? Did you watch it when it was originally airing on Cartoon Network? Original run. I remember, uh, that's kind of funny, because two months ago, uh, two months ago, sorry, two months before Young Justice premiered in my country, I always like to play video games. Yes, I will be rich a good friend of Rich for that. I like to play video games in my computer and I always went to Cartoon Network for Latin America and we play games. But accidentally, I just clicked to Cartoon Network from the US, the original website in the US, and I saw some ads of the shows, promoting the show that no Superboy, no Miss March. And I was like, what kind of Teen Titans are these? <laughs> Yes, and and when I saw Superboy, I thought, oh, okay, I think I know. It's John Justice. It's when the just it's the Justice League members when they were young. <laughs> this is what I saw, and then two months later, John Justice premiered in my country, and I was like, oh, okay, I was wrong, but I am a human being. I can make mistake, and my brother just my little brother just sit down with me and we start watching john justice uh, since the beginning so in latin america the things were a little bit different the uh, the translation is made on mexico so they wait like 10 or 12 episodes and then when they have all those episodes recorded they put new episode to monday to friday for some time this is basically how it works. So I have to go to all my homework and then my mom say, okay, you want, you, do you want to watch the show? You have to do your homework and then you can watch it. The, if you don't do my homework, you can watch it. And I'm like, mom, please. Always the struggle. So, cause I was, I was curious, you, you mentioned this. So uh, when you watched Young Justice, it was translated into Spanish, correct? Yes. That's why when, uh, do you remember the episode in season one when they go to drop some? And yeah. and they were talking in Spanish. They translate everything that uh, they all watch. Uh, they all say and all the dialogues was in Spanish. But then when I saw the original episode, I was like, "Oh, they were really talking in Spanish." <laughs> okay, I appreciate that the show though with foreign language, even it's not quite a perfect. But I really love that Jamie Thomason take the time to okay make the accent sound in that way. Try to sound like a Mexican. Try to sound like a Cuban accent. That we saw in episode eight, uh, episode eighteen this week. And I and I pre- I really appreciate that. My fr- I show my friends that we are laughing the way that they pronounce some words in in <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> yeah, because what made by Danny Trego Machete. <laughs> it's amazing. We love it in Latin America. So oh, yeah, so cool. That's so cool. Uh, so speaking of all this, what was your history with DC and comics in general before you watched Young Justice? Well, I always watched Justice League Unlimited with my cousin and the Teen Titans. This is why when I saw Young Justice, I'm like, okay, that's kind of version on Teen Titans, but just different characters. The um, I always like um Batman backstory that is really is tragic. And you can relate with the, the character. I always like Sumer, Superman because he's 
he's so perfect. He always, always right. And then that was the reason that it shocked me so much in so, in John Justice that he rejected to be with Superboy. And I was like, what? But you're perfect. <laughs> you 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 always go for the right thing. That the, I really like the the, uh, the creators took this. They humanize the character. Yeah. yeah. They humanize it. And I was just like, everyone was here yet. I was like, go and see. It is your son. <laughs> He's suffering. Superboy always be my favorite because of the his complexity. And I know about it. He's going to be part of my, the way he was writing, he was always going to be, be part of my heart for that. Because I can, I can relate with him. I sometimes identified with him with when I was little and I saw this character that doesn't know who he is and want to do what is right but sometimes just don't know how. I he, and especially when he said that to Black Canary after all false situation at the end of that episode I just started crying because that was so deep when he what he said to Black Canary and I was like but can I give him a hug? He needs a hug. <laughs> Please let me hug, hug him for me. He's yes, a good I, kid. He's a good kid and he deserves a hug. He's come yes. so far. Yeah, and with comics, um, well, I remember my first comic was, I was in the, U, in the US, visit my, my aunt, and I was 12. And a comic was in a serial. It was a continuation of an adventure of the Justice League. I didn't know English, so I didn't understand what was happening. And, and I can see I, that being a problem. But I just, I just maybe understand what happening because of the pictures. And they were, they just still really were fighting with a monster that looked like Chewbacca from Star Wars. And I remember Flash, he went to the prison and talked with his father and his father gave him an idea. And at the end of the, of the comic, they, they want and they take the creature to Oa. But I think my first, experience as well with comics was John Joseph's Die Comics when the people say, hey, you know John Joseph have comics? Like, what? He have comics? Let Give it to me, cousin. Thank you. Give it to me. Especially, my favorites are Campfire Secrets because know the psychology of this character, their stories, know who they are and what they are, who are in that moment. Especially with Miss Martian because <laughs> I was, that was bef- uh, after I saw season two and I was like, oh my God, this girl is lying. I lost. <laughs> because that's the reality. I, yes, because that's the reality that she wished it happened. But unfortunately, that wasn't the reality, especially with Macomb. <laughs> yeah, season three. So many, so many new revelations about all that. But out of curiosity, again, before we move on, I have so many questions. Um, did you... With the Young Justice tie-in comics, did you get translations of those or did you read those in English? No, that happened in English because in that time, uh, my English improved. So I sometimes I just read it and I don't understand. So I, read, I have to come back and translate some words yeah. in the computer. But now that I'm in the English immersion program, when I read it again, I now, okay, now I understand what happened here. Yeah, but learning a new language is a whole pro- new process. You always keep learning. Yeah, yeah, I I understand. <laughs> uh, no, but that's so cool. I was just curious. I was like, do you get do you do you get translated comics in general? There, do you does that a thing that exists? Because I know they translate novels and stuff for other countries, but does that happen with comics? <laughs> Not no. that much. Maybe manga, but does the manga is made by fan? The translation is made by fans. No oh. official translation. Well, cool. in, in the case in Naruto, I think that there is official translation for the U- the U.S., I guess. I don't know. <laughs> all very cool. Thank you for putting up with all of my questions. Uh, but so today <laughs> we are not talking about any of that, as fascinating as all that is. Today we are talking about a really interesting topic that I know almost nothing about, <laughs> which is the United Nations and its representation within Young Justice. Because of your background with Model UN, you wanted to discuss how the show handles politics and how you think yes. it features one of the most well-researched representations of the UN on TV, I believe you said to us at one point. Yes. So, so what is it about the way Young Justice handles the UN that jumps out at you that you want to talk about today? 
I find it interesting that in season three, the UN have, well, in season two, we saw a lot of things about the UN because of the rich and how secretary sent uh, general secretary trusting them. And yeah, that was a disaster. <laughs> we really saw that at the end of season two. But now that we have uh, the UN have a big role in this, uh, this whole plot of meta human trafficking in season three, I found kind of interesting the meeting in the UN and of course the role of Let's Luthor after general secretary. The model UN is a simulation. Sometimes we're in the simulation, uh, we get close to some things and we don't get close to process things. So basically, yeah. I just for be sure, I yesterday I went to Funglode. Is an organization that uh, organizes models, a, a models UN here in the country, and I have a kind of informal meeting with Ignacio. Is a friend of mine that directed that organization, and I said, "Oh well, there is a show," and and I saw the scene. Uh, what do you think? Uh, they that happened exactly in the in in a meeting of the UN. What do you think about the strategy that Temesquira and Atlantis show try to convince others? And he tell uh, a couple of things about it. But I want to get I want to go in order <laughs> about politics. Go for yeah, it. because that's season three. Um. The how they handle. Okay, the first time I have some notes here. The first time when we saw politics in George Jose in great expression was in episode. Uh, let me act here. Episode ten targets when we have that conflict with the Premier Minister Sen of South Relicia and the General C Men Lee of North Relicia. That's kind of interesting because arbit. Uh, they can this those countries couldn't solve the problem in a bilateral uh, bilateral negotiation. If when the country have um, negotiation and try to solve things, but that felt in real life, a lot of country prefer to use arbitration. That can happen with a third person who helped them to find a solution or with a tribune. For example, in UN, it sits a tribune called International Court of Justice that I part of the simulation so many times. Yes, I I decided I want to be a lawyer thanks to that to that experience. So in this time, thank you. In this time, they decide to have uh, Lex Luthor to be the arbiters to the uh, to the thing. And I found it quite interesting this tragedy. First, because that happened exactly in that way, when the, it does something that the country does where they can solve the problem by themselves, call someone else to take the decisions or help them with, with that. But I also was kind of impressed with Sled's diplomatic strategy because Sled said our people don't have nothing in common. But that's Sled said, no, believe me, they, you have something in common. For example, your fascination for Relisha T. Yeah, but that's that's really interesting because when you have those countries who were divided, thanks Superboy, that were divided <laughs> after World War II, you have it's been like fifty or sixty dec uh, fifteen or sixty years later, the cultures will be different, but there is something that keeps the same. So that's a good strategy to use when to want to una uh, unify those countries that have, uh, that have there's still something in common cultural traditions etc so though generally you wouldn't want lex luther doing that arbitration but yeah it's a good strategy <laughs> yeah even if uh, he said it, i'm not deaf i'm not an angel but this time i'm the side of the angels you <laughs> want me to do hell and you want me Very to true. end with that and and red and Roy, now sorry, Will was like, yeah, so the problem. But yeah, it's something interesting. One the the end, because we saw at the end of the episode that they sent they saw a treaty that in the that with the time judge we saw the they ever eventually lead a reunification. So. The only thing that I have with, with that episode that that kind of process take long because that whole process of arbitration take like two days, <laughs> I think one or, or two days, yeah. but that can take months, especially if those countries have previous pro problem. But in the context of the show, it works very well. And I was impressed because you can see the status of a country never stays the same. It always keep evolving. And uh, so something that we saw in season three is that that tree to reunification and now they are re reunite 
real Asia, as we saw in the meeting, that the representation said in the in the script said Renite real Asia. I was I was surprised because I never saw on um, this street maybe they were broken, but no, no. Uh, eventually, Russia go and let's lose our plan works very well. Yeah, I guess, and that may position that help let Luthor to get as no not just a businessman is is not a unificator or something like that that help him with the good image that later in the season two will help them to get the the united the secretary of the united nations that's that's helped a lot a lot of people are not bad good so even if he made something good we don't know is that either unification was something good maybe in season in other season, we will saw the consequences. But I like that the show told you the implications and the consequences along the way. And another thing that I really like to talk that happened in, in season one is Queen Bee, Bialia. That <laughs> country have a lot of change, especially with Queen Bee, her strategy. That maybe will sound a little bad, but I found this woman kind of fascinating. Because of the strategy that she used. She's the only yeah. woman in the light. Yeah. But we saw in Image, I think one of your favorite episodes, because it took uh, your favorite characters and was right by my favorite writer of the show, Nicole Newbuk. Yes. And we saw Ruman Hajafti, the Democratic president elected for Kurak, and the conflict between this, between Kurak and the dictator of the neighbor nation, Bialia, ruled by Queen B. I found kind of interesting because the strategy of, of what Queen B wants to do is that before they were unified. So in claim to that tradition, to that history that both countries had, they, she wants to use that to reunify, there is a lot of unification in this season, actually, in season one, actually, I have to say it. But thanks the team, I wanted to say, even if the team stop her, take this opportunity, I like that she keeps thinking, okay, I didn't do it in this way, but let's try another thing. Something that get me was the Thai comic when they explained that in season later in the same season, Connor and Megan went to be Alia check that Queen Bee is not going to do nothing with the president. And she used that show. Uh, you remember, right? Yeah. So the target never was Rum, uh, Ruman Hajafti. The target was his brother, Suman Hajafti. And why? Because she, probably she say, if I kill this man, some other elected president we will choose. I need to, the president, say something, someone that is under my control. So he playing that shot. He gets uh, she, uh, he shot Suman Hayafti, and now he became a hero for his people. But they don't know how he's uh, he followed Queen Bee, and I found that strategy kind of fascinating because this woman and Les Luthor are those kind of characters that you can just mis- misunderstood on the red, sorry, on the red, because they want to keep control of the entire scenario and know how to act and where not. So I. Will think twice if I want to fight with them. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. The, so you see, when you participate in the model UN, you need a, a diplomatic, you need to know the status of your country all the time. This is why, uh, not just me, a lot of dip- uh, a lot of delegations, they have the newspaper on the phone, the app, or in the computer. So they keep a kid watching the news, so something's happened, and another des- delegation mentioned it, you know how to respond. The status of your country can change in a small way or in a big way. That in a small way is something that really impressed me because two months ago I was rewatching Usual Suspect. It's one of my favorite episodes from season one, and I love it. Uh, no, yeah, I love it when they when they say, but something interesting is that in the beginning, the ceremony to join the new Justice League members and all that, before the leak go into the get got into the Hall of Justice, Superman, Aquaman, and Green Arrow I start with the with the journalists, I start making questions to them. And what do you think some of the reporters ask to Aquaman? Aquaman, will Atlantis will join the UN? I just like when I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, this world building, that there is a lot of things that keep going. Yeah. And then we saw that in that moment, 
just oh, okay did she just say that in season three we have okay now they join the UN they are part yeah. of it and that's so conscious writing I uh, yeah. I guess no that's really awesome I I'd never actually noticed that before no you're totally right that does happen I never like made that connection between those two moments that's so never cool. and I just rewatched that episode a lot when but when the atos of between the first half of the second and now we have the second half, when re- I watched that, I just stopped my computer and I screamed, Brandon, Greg, why do you do this to me? <laughs> no, yeah, I was, I was impressed. And when I, I just was watching and putting the your in, original language to understand more. And when I saw this reporter say that, we could, we could, and then they just simply discover, oh, the team is gone. But we couldn't hear a uh, uh, we couldn't hear Queen's Ar- King Arthur response, unfortunately. But we know that okay, yes, seven years later. But yes, <laughs> might have taken them seven years, but they eventually got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is basically all the politics that we saw in season one, and we got the war field living because the whole pro- even if not exactly exactly the process they made them feel they were to make them feel real as possible a rich said that this call creates living world is that is correct but we got a lot of politics in season two especially with the rich and something interesting is that in the first i think in the third episode we got the introduction of the League Public Liaison Officer Catherine Kubert. That's something that happened in real life. A lot of organizations have a represent, uh, a, like no government organization have their representation if the UN, if they can be there, listen, if the topic that the UN is discussing in that, in that moment is related to that organization. And almost they can give their own opinions of what the organization see that maybe can help to solve or find a solution for that problem. So I that was really interesting to, to, to see that, that woman. But something kind of interesting as well was the the high call of Rainbow. Yeah, because yeah. The, there is something like that in real life that's called International Criminal Court. That, that I think that will be the, the, the high court of Rainbow will be the equivalent of the International Criminal Court in R16. When they, the try, I really like the time that it takes for the trial because it took six months. That <laughs> process are really long. It can take years. It also works for the context of the show and also respect the, all the process because there is a lot of process. They have to testify. They have to show evidence and they, oh my God, there is a long process to that. So yeah, <laughs> they respect, they just, they respect that reality as well. This show has a lot. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> in terms of politics, when the rich present in the UN and I speak with, that's kind of funny because we saw Sen after Premier Minister of South Relicia, and then we discovered that with the time John he became the General Secretary Sen. I never realized that we are talking about the same person until <laughs> yesterday. Yeah, I was like Sen, Sen when I heard. When, when I have that name before, and then when I come back and rewatch of those epic uh, of those episodes, I realized we are I was talking about the same person. <laughs> That's a levels a, a great sense of continuity in a in a big in such a big way. Absolutely. So, out of curiosity, what do you usually see in other shows that present the UN differently from the way Young Justice does? I think it's not just the process. I think it's the implication of the consequences of that decision in politics, how they can affect and don't justice of interesting quality to show the consequences of every act that affect how reunified now great Bialia affect, affect to those heroes, how Atlantis joined the UN uh, affect to uh, affect the UN and now they have maybe a chance to convince others. Uh, now Atlantis have representation. But yes, it is so, I was so surprised when I saw God and Troy there. I was like, oh, they have representation because the UN started with 50, uh, started in 1945 after World War II with just 53 members, 53 yeah. founding members. And now it's 193. It means that the UN have a politic of inclusion. 
in that uh, have a great politic of inclusion that it, that everyone joined to work together and create a better world. This is why I admire the organization as well as what his duty to help people. So sitting there is something definitely that will happen in the UN and uh, reinforce that principle of inclusion to uh, to have them. Yeah. I need to talk about the meeting. There is some things. Go for it. The meeting that we have in season three, with episode two, after the interesting campaign that our, our beautiful guard revolutionary Logan creates for help those people. And after that, we got the meeting. And I showed to Ignacio and he said, well, <laughs> first, there is a few things. For example, if Catherine Kuber wants to make an announcement that announcement, it wouldn't be in front of the UN. It will be in a press conference because it's not for the state. It's for every everyone to know Batman, Batwoman, Hardware. They are no longer part of the league. That's something that will happen in the, in that case. But he said, I'm kind of interested in that they just really have representation because it's not a, it's kind of no governmental organization, if we can call the Justice League in that way, I guess, he said. Yeah. And something that Ignacio said that gave me thinking a little bit, he said, you're never going to see the general secretary control the debate. He's not. The general secretary, according to the United Nations Charter, the, this duty is administration. He's not part of the debate. Yeah. But he said, we're talking about let's Luthor. And he said, yes, I, I have a childhood. I ha-, and she said, I have, I did watch just a little limited. And we're talking about let's loot or someone who want to have the control of the entire scenario to manipulate everyone that is in front of him to get what he wants, get the what the light wants. But what General Secretary said in season two, that's what a real general secretary does, represent the UN, made relationship with other uh, people and and aliens, I guess, and that would be the case. <laughs> But yes, that's something that will happen. Well, but Des Luthor is not according to his duty, but he said in the context of the show, he has said that he's doing that, but he's not supposed to doing that. <laughs> he's not supposed to, but he is Lex Luthor, so <laughs> we should expect it. <laughs> Exa- exactly. And another thing is that he said that that make a, in the UN and in the model UN ex- uh, as well, First, all we together we say all the speech, all the speeches that we rep- express our pos- in the speech. Your country represent your pos- the position the country have according to the problem or the situation. And then we got a motion when the we start like formal reunions when every every delegation have one minute to express. Uh, another information that to want to add or another solution that they found. Yes, you need, in, when you are in the UN or you are in the model as well, you need to learn how to synthesize the idea and say it properly and correctly. That's some of the abilities that you learn. And then we start to the informal reunion where we try together in an informal way to find the solution. You don't see in the UN a speech and then plop, uh, the the ambassador screaming each other in some kind of way. I think God did very well, but an ambassador don't supposed to interrupt not when someone is speaking, especially when the, the general secretary is speaking in that way. But I consider the strategy as a diplomatic that God used to uh, when he said that politics at costing life. We can do it. The strategy to combine all of that, there is a lot of people that are suffering because they just only can do his job. That's a great thing. To, uh, that's a great strategy to, to, to touch the humanity of the other delegation. But through your yeah, strategy, um, how can I say that? That wasn't great. <laughs> because <laughs> I, Try I went about things poorly? Um, yeah, kind of. I understand what she said because it have it have sense. She's a temiscura. She's a warrior. But yeah. you, what you need to be careful what you say, especially in the way that you say, because I, I made those accusations, even in be greater Bialia, those sort of things made that kind of accusation so explicit that doesn't. That's not something that the ambassador 
those in the UN because the UN is also a problem and some ambassadors that in really bad way considering that it's an opportunity to tell the other country what he's doing bad and not. We are here to negotiate and find a solution. And what she did that the heroes will, uh, will do what they must regulations or not. And I was just like, oh my God, what you have done, girl? Because <laughs> if you say that in, I just say that you basically have said that the Justice League is over the law and you're going to give him more, re- you, he makes Lex Luthor words easy because they give reasons to another delegation to tr- trust in the Justice League, to trust in Lex, in the, the Let's have his reason to give limitations to the Justice League. I appreciate that she did uh, that she tried that later in the season, I thought in episode 14 that she showed the more justice destroy and the consequences. I was really was a really touch speed. That's the way that is the best way to convince others. Yeah. <laughs> Something that got me in the speech was uh, not in the speech when God's intervention, what well, he mentioned security council. Well, the UN has six big organs. That is General Assemble, Security Council, Economy and Social Council, Secretary, the Secretary, sorry, International Court of Justice, and Trustership Council. That is not working anymore. And specifically, if you want a humanitarian mission to pass, that the UN will do that. You need the approbation of the Security Council. Even in Nazio, when he was watching the show, in Nazio say, and God say that, he said, okay, that's what this guy is doing is right. <laughs> yeah, that shows investigation. That shows that the writers investigate. Even if the mechanic is something common, you can see all the ambassadors say their opinion and interrupt kind of each other in a parliament or in a senate. Not in the UN, but even if the mechanic wasn't quite exactly what happened in the UN, they get closed and show investigation. And I, I was impressed when I when I saw that because I was in the some of the simulation was security uh, that I was last year was security console. Believe me, that that a lot, a lot of people that I've with me in the in the model UN called that delegation fire. <laughs> Yes, fire, because they treat all this problem like terrorism, nuclear attacks. They thought the big, the big topics that attend with the security. This is why the name Security Council. And I remember and last year in Nirmulak, the, the, the model for Latin American and the Caribbean in, in New York, there is something called emergency session. Emergency session is... When something happened around the world so quickly and there is a problem and the UN have to intervene so the situation don't get worse. So imagine if someone appears in your room because it was in a hotel, someone at 3 a.m. appears in your room, knocks the door and he said, something explodes in Middle East. You need to solve the situation now. <laughs> yeah, they didn't give me time to get my, my suit. I literally have to run in the hotel with a pajama. <laughs> Yeah, you can see the photo. All of them, we are, we are pajama and try to solve the, the situation. And it's not just for security council, it's for every commission of organ that is simulated. If there is emergency session, they need to stop what they're doing, the problem, and try to solve the solution to keep the peace. And in the model UN, there is a part that is not diplomacy. It's called uh, it's news, the commission of news, when those guys who really like periodism and be a journalist, the authority give them famous newspaper like New York Times, CAM, and another famous newspaper. And these guys really need to cover everything that is happening in every salon. These guys, I admire them because it's not easy. <laughs> they work af- uh, before, during, and after the event. These guys, are, the, per- the journalists are amazing. I have to say, they great, do a great job. <laughs> I consider that the show took politi- uh, took including politics may not just, as I said before, feel this world that they, they are 16 feel real. Um, I really, they impressed me that they, I, they showed me that I grew up a little bit because when I was a kid and I saw those scenes that I told you, I didn't understand nothing. 
Yeah. And then when I get all this experience and now I understand what is happening, you can see the change. You can see the big change. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so I did want to ask because you mentioned uh, a few of the things, especially stuff that comes up in season three with like Catherine Colbert and Atlantis and Themyscira and everything. So I wanted to ask from your perspective as someone who knows more about this, how do you think like those more fantastical elements of Young Justice, like the fact that there are superheroes and that there are fictional countries that we have to figure out how they interact <laughs> with the UN? Yeah. How do you think that adds or changes the way that they deal with politics and the UN on the show? Well, I consider that even if they are superheroes, they are personal as well. And they are li even if you're a Martian or you are a Kryptonian in Superman's case, you are living there and you need to adapt to you need to adapt to this world, not the world adapt to you because it doesn't the things doesn't work in that way. So I think that they are humanized a little bit those uh, fantastical elements that join that okay he's a superhero but also have to deal with politics like everyone is affected by politics like uh, us in real in real life so i think that works as a complement i guess yeah to that i also like that the, in this season they they mentioned the crisis of refugees i was oh yes i almost forgot when I want to ask you, that's my head canon. I don't know if that happened or if Gretel Brandon say something about it. But if Queen Bee in season two have kind of the control with, B uh, with Kurat because he has so much hajafti there. Yeah. I think, I don't know, because I was really surprised when Queen Formacovia said Bialia took Kurat. And I was like, wait, what? they did what? <laughs> Yeah, that impressed me because it, that's not the way that the light works. They don't attach so directly. They work from the shadows. If yeah. I consider maybe that between season two and season three, maybe the team tell the world that Suman is in is under control of Queen Bee, maybe, and Queen Bee doesn't find another way to take control of the country, but another way by force, yeah. maybe. But that made me worry because if the light made something that is not a common that's not something that they will do in common situation maybe in the future that they can consider to use the nuclear option because of the circumstances yeah and that was like no i don't want to induce this situation please <laughs> no i don't want that but yes they show that the, even everyone is affected by the circumstances and no one can uh, run from that. Even Queen B with the strategy, he said, okay, if I can get by the peace, I, let, I get by the by a military way. And she did that. And I really like that they told the, the refugees because right now we have an increase of refugees. And I like that the queen and king, rest in peace, Brian's parents, they opened his country to allow those people to have a home because of their home is now destroyed or basically in Bialia's country right now. And that's something really, really human because a lot of countries right now open his frontier for those uh, for those refugees and some unfortunately don't because they have a lot of people already in their countries. Yeah. So that's something that the UN, the crisis of refugees is something that the UN deal with it. And he sent the blue helmets. I think that's the correct translation, blue helmets. That is the team from, it's, it's not an army. It's not an army, but it's a lot of militaries that help, uh, that help refu refugees as well. I, I was, when I saw Hello the first time, I just like, oh, she's a refugee and she's amazing. No, yes. that's, no, that topic really got me because it's something that is happening right now. And, I really like that like, Greg and Brandon, right? The human trafficking. With, now they don't have those limitations for uh, Chandler's kids. They can say what, what's happening in it without limitation. Show that terrifying is this, and we have a humanity. Five yeah. for those, th that thing does happen again. Or don't happen to others that kids get kidnapped and yada, yada, yada. And, Yes, that's that's kind of impressive. That really complex to the story and made that they show you that the story is now grow up with you. For those who saw the show in original run. Yeah. yeah. 
(laughs) It's a lot. But I think a lot of that stuff that you're talking about and the way it ties into everything else we've been talking about is how the writers use these situations that like we don't we don't have super powered teen trafficking in this world but the fact that they use something like that like this may this fictional crisis to kind of deal with themes that are absolutely happening in our real world and the way that like everything kind of has something that it can be compared to in our real world that makes all of those politics and everything seem more real Mm because like we don't know how our UN would deal with the fact that like, oh, teenagers are randomly getting superpowers and getting kidnapped. But we do know how governments are dealing with everything else that is related to that in our world, just minus the superpowers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really great. I mean, this is why the we all this, this is why I really want to I need to talk about politics and I didn't <laughs> find another way that with you the well, the the John Justice podcast and that's kind of funny because in the beginning I I was scared I don't want to do it. and they all my friends but you can do it just go to the program send them the send them the email and and see what maybe is happening and now I'm here <laughs> a dream come true. Well, I'm glad I'm glad we could help with that. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but I would like to ask since this came up and I didn't even think to write it down when I was writing notes. Do you have any thoughts on the uh the Markovia situation, all of the politics surrounding that or I mean, we have, they've gone through three leaders and a bunch of other stuff this season. I feel like that's pretty unstable. Yeah, Markovia situation. I consider that Gregor is a really intelligent character and really have a lot of knowledge, even his young age. Like imagine have 17 years and have to deal with a country. That's not that easy. That's such a big responsibility. Even if they prepare for you, they prepare you for that kind of responsibility. It's not the same preparation, that application and you make mistakes. But I really before that, I really like that they gave him his own agency because when I saw um, his uncle say no uh, it was Brian who killed his father and I was like and everyone wants to believe wants to believe him because that's the cliche of every show said that if, if the adult is if, if the if the prince is young they're going to believe in the adult but no when Brian said arrest bear and the lamb I know you uncle that means that he's more intelligent than you think and First, he has a lot of things. He has to deal with the refugees that the Marco- some Markovians doesn't like Kurakis there. And have to deal with many humans. Oh, I don't want to be, if I have the opportunity, I don't want to be that, that, that Gregor right now. But <laughs> it's probably very stressed. It's very stressed. But I think he's solving the situation one by one. Not try to solve every solution, just everyone together because it, he's not going get to it, get it. Because we saw an episode, I I guess episode nine when Brion was watching uh, his tablet and he said his Gregor was giving him a speech. The Kuraki people are allowing to stay here because my parents fight for this and don't want to. If they were here, they don't want to use his death as an their death as an excuse. So I think the strategy is used very well to solve a solution. And then when the journalist asks, "Oh, what about meta human trafficking?" They say, "Okay, we will do that later." Thank you. We will will that later. One problem so maybe, at a time. One problem at a time. I think Gregor is doing great. I I think he will be a he will be a great king, and I know he doesn't want to kick Brion out, but he recognized that he won't be. He's a meta human, and he know how to control his power. In that moment, now he's getting more control. He's not gonna be uh, safe there. Yeah. So. It's uh, even you can see his the pain in his. Uh, I think Crispin made a great job with the voice of Gregor because in the voice you can see the pain that he have to leave his brother, his family, out of his home. It, I think and he said that wasn't that wasn't easy. That was a dif- a really difficult decision. It was for good because now we see that Brion now handles his ability. Uh, his abilities now and have more confidence about himself. Imagine Brion with superpowers in Markovia. He's probably going to explode everything. Ooh, it would not be good. <laughs> yeah, so I think the thing's going to be better if Gregor 
continue learning about his studies and he I know he maybe at the end of the season or maybe in season four hopefully please Comic Con I need an announcement I need it so badly maybe we can see that they have uh, they he found a solution for that but now the world is now facing this new thing and now the world share, uh, share the, the human share the world with meta humans And at the beginning, it's really common that that kind of problems happen. If we get we get to it, and we and they adapt to those uh, they adapt to those problems. I guess. I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see what happens in the rest of the season going forward. With all of that, <laughs> there is a lot of going on in this season, and I'm enjoying that those characters doesn't have the moment didn't have their moment to shine in season two are shining right now because even if i love so much the original team i really love them seem as an adult and give them now we made what we we made our choice and now it, we made what we have to do we do what did what we have to do but now you are the young generation right now you have to it now it's your turn to do what's right that moment between Aramis and tara in this episode i think get me in so many levels Yes, that, that moment was really strong. Maybe Judas Contract get a different ending. Please, God, different ending. <laughs> and a lot that these kids are growing, and I really enjoy to have uh, to have time with them, especially with the guards, or, uh, with, with Beast Boy. Oh, my God. Oh, in a lot of TV shows, I saw Beast Boy as a kid, but now we have Beast Boy as a teenager, an activist, someone who knows that he has a voice and can speak for those who don't have it. And I'm, I was like, your mother will be proud of you. <laughs> you are amazing. Even you are a great leader. And this is why I yeah. love, and he's so honest. This is what I love that Megan said, no, he's not going to be part of the anti-life thing because he's really <laughs> honest. And he, the Beast Boy is... He wants to be honest with his team and imagine Miss Boy manipulate or don't say the whole information to the group. No. Megan yeah, no. did. Um, something about it, that's not political, that's something personal, is that I'm the older in my family and I don't want my little brothers make my, my mistakes or learn in a hard way some lessons that we learn in life. This is why when I saw a way mission, And Megan not like a big sis that protect that wants to the the ones who love. I find really identify with her because I cannot protect it with my, my with my brothers. I have yeah. I have to admit I I when she she always do the protective sister thing. I was like me me <laughs> I I feel represent for all those big sisters uh, around the world. We are represent there. Yes. I really like that the Osar is now on trending. That given it's gonna kind of interesting because in this era, this a lot of so that we have things that the our parents didn't have like social media, and now the measures can get far far from we are and inspire a lot of people to do what's right, but bigger than the Justice League. <laughs> This is not gonna end well. I can I was like Caldor when he said I said what? <laughs> no, but I really like their inspire they're young, they're inspiring people, they're making difference. And now the Eduardo joins the team that joins sorry, joins the outsiders that someone that they can someone that those kids that have because Eduardo happened through that. He was kidnapped in season two. Was a meta human. He didn't know he didn't know how to control his power. Now he know he wants to learn all this how to do it. So the best way is someone that happened to all those pro all those process of adaptation. I found that Eduardo is gonna be a great addition on the outsider, and let's see where it's going. I think this season is it's been a it's been amazing I, in so many ways, yeah. especially it, for I, in my opinion that this time. I really like season two, but in this time they are giving to those characters time to oh, every character some time to shine and evolve yeah. and change, and we are a view where we can see that. So yes, it is it's really amazing. Really in the aster. <laughs> I totally agree. And this has been so much fun talking to you about all of this. 
So thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower, Shanley. Uh, where can people find you here on Earth Prime? Oh, well, they can find me on Twitter, like at Shanley002. Yeah, my name is different because my, my cousin um, write, um, he created my hotmail, so he didn't know how to spell my name. But it's kind of, I just let it that way because it's funny. It, it, it made it special. So, yeah, you can find me on Twitter. Right now, especially we all do, I always publish some th- some stuff about John Justice and another, a bunch of stuff sometimes. Yeah. I will include those links down in the show notes so people can find you over there and see more of your thoughts about Young Justice. So thank you to everyone for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, crashingthemode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if that isn't enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you're able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and so much more. And as always, stay well, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening and stay whelmed. Well